it's interesting to have these conversations now, particularly because the, the price and the sort of the cost of sequencing the human genome is, is rapidly decreasing year by year. And so it, it becomes really uh, a possibility to actually start to prepare technologies and, and kind of consumer facing technologies to actually accommodate some of this now. Yeah. And, and yeah, so it becomes quite terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> it is quite daunting. And um, I guess we're going to come on to how this all affects consumer behavior. Mm. Um, and yeah. Maybe I'll just say before, before that, yeah, yeah. what's interesting within this topic, we talk about um, you know, your, your, your phrase, which was wonderful about the difference between gene editing and gene mutation, mm -hmm. um, is what we might consider to be a preferable or a non-preferable human characteristic. So of course, we don't want any humans to suffer you wouldn't conscientiously choose to have a child that you know is going to suffer. But what, what is the difference between suffering and having a, 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 a good quality of life is, 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 a, is, a, is a, almost like a tacit cultural moment uh, that differs between nation. Um, and a really good example of this is uh, until 1978, the British Psychological Association considered homosexuality to be a mental illness. And so hypothetically with this type of technology, you, you might be able to design in or out homosexuality considering you know, that's, that's a disability or a non-preferable human characteristic. There's a, there's a lot of um, uh, deaf parents, for example, that, that really want their children to be deaf because that's their culture and that's the way that they live and they kind of want to see that being carried on through their, through their family. And, and you know, what, what designates the difference between something being preferable and non-preferable? Yeah, Which absolutely. is really important because uh, this is the basis of all of human interaction in terms of, you know, if, if we move now into, into talking about marketing and products and objects, when you look at something and you find it attractive or not, or, you know, uh, preferable or not preferable, your brain is making these subconscious decisions similarly to our brain making subconscious decisions on things like uh, uh, Down syndrome or homosexuality being preferable or not preferable. Yeah, and this is really interesting because again, it's, there's self-identity, sort of how you view yourself, mm -hmm. and there's how the group views you as well. And it, it'd be quite interesting to know whether you should hide, should someone be, let's say, edited to not have Down syndrome? Mm. Should they be made aware of this? You know, is it their legal right to be made aware of this? Should other people be made aware of this? Does the knock-on effect mean that they perhaps have a extra strength in sporting activities? Do they then get classed into a separate group? And does that then actually just affect their life in a similar way to being Down syndrome, cast out of society for something that they had no control over in the first place. Are you, you suggesting that society might separate those who have been edited from those who haven't been? I would, I would propose that that would ex definitely happen. <laughs> Absolutely, I think that's something that is very prevalent it's, it's, in society. Yeah. We like to group people, and if that is something that happens in society, then you know that other people are going to want to know. That's a really good insight. You, you might suggest that with gene edited people, you would start to have these types of class systems. However, we talk about the uncanny valley in, in digital technology. So the okay. do, do you know that? the uncanny no. valley? The uncanny valley is um, the, the moment between when the human brain understands a, an image of a person to be real and an image of a person to be computer made. Okay. And so there's a moment in between there where the human brain can't quite comprehend whether it is a real human or it's an avatar. And that's the uncanny valley. Okay. And I, I think that there's a very similar area when we talk about plastic surgery um, or, you know, uh, testosterone use and so on, where you start to, where you, you kind of understand and register that this is a, a sort of a biological human, but there's something about them that has been altered. I think with gene editing, it will be very hard to actually understand that because it's, it's their genes that have been edited. It's, it's not something that will sort of stick out as an unusual characteristic unless 
there's someone with incredibly piercing blue eyes and incredibly platinum blonde hair mm. that's very unusual. But, but then equally, we could say that, that genetically, that is possible naturally. Yeah. We can also get into the conversation about what we consider to be a strong gene. Because, um, you know, blonde, blue eyed female being the kind of paradigm of beauty in, in popular culture, I would say was, was sort of the late, uh, late 90s, uh, mid 2000s. I think it's shifting massively. I think that was very much um, uh, a kind of Western Caucasian perspective of beauty. Very much so. And I think that actually in, in 20, 30 years, we'll want to look more Asian. I mean, this is the interesting thing with sort of genes, gene editing and then product marketing. How do these two worlds collide in the future? Yeah. So as, as, as we were discussing, that the sort of foundation of every single cognitive decision of whether that is a strong choice or a, or a less strong choice in terms of, um, you know, what we consider to be a disability or a preferable human characteristic or even within that kind of moment where we look at someone and decide whether they're sexy or not sexy, mm. that the way that your brain works on deciding that, 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 that kind of split second decision is exactly the same mechanism as, as, we, as we have kind of emotional relationship with objects and brands and communication and so on. And so as, as we're talking about marketing and branding and then kind of the design of objects, particularly around identity, so in the world of fashion, the, the foundation of all of this really is genes and the way that kind of genetic technology will influence and interact with artificial intelligence. If we can get to the bottom of that, then we are essentially redesigning marketing systems mm -hmm. and redesigning the, the sort of desire mechanisms that underpin why we want certain objects and how they've been constructed and the subliminal meaning that designers use to sort of craft and sculpt objects in certain ways. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, it's really this conversation about actually starting to build ontologies or maps around these the different relationships and connections that form this this kind of large world um, that then we can sort of design from and build from and and back to your question you know we, we actually don't know the genes yet to do with height or you know th mm. th they're so complex systems it's exactly the same with 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 this in relation to marketing it's very complex but that's not to say that we won't be there very soon yeah <laughs> and, and so it's, it's really interesting to start to have these kind of speculative conversations about what is going to happen when this technology does get to that place. How do you see that? I mean, let's have that conversation now. How do you see that funneling down eventually if it gets more prevalent? In, in China, this, this sort of culture around gene editing and genetic technology is very much derived from whatever the government says is, is right or wrong. Um, and it, it will happen in China. It is happening and it will continue to happen at pace. And it will be for kind of a select, uh, you know, 1% of China. So very affluent people that will be able to afford to gene edit their children and so on. What's interesting is when these children are, uh, you know, 12 mm -hmm. and starting to become young adults, um, the rest of the world won't want to have their kids sort of be outpaced and not be as good as these super high IQ, very talented, very beautiful uh, Chinese children. Um, and so that will just have this kind of knock on effect that will that will, uh, you know, slowly trickle into the rest of society. And it will essentially create a new class system because, of course, the beginning of this type of applied technology will be extremely expensive. And so it will be the affluent people that, that are able to sort of fine tune their, he their, their genome. Mm -hmm. um, there, there will be some really interesting scenarios that come around this, like uh, the idea that if, if a parent has edited their child and then the child sues them because they don't like how they've been edited, that, that could be a possibility. Oh, that'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's going to happen. Maybe f in America. But yeah. Definitely in America. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good law lawsuit over there. Yeah. And all of this technology is, is sort of based upon CRISPR. So, yes. you know, the, the sort of design of, of, of DNA before it sort of turns into a, a fetus in, yeah. a, in the womb. 
Um, but I was really interested in, in a type of technology, genetic technology called epigenetics, which okay. was really, um, it, was, it was a hot technology in 2014 okay. when the project started. I think that the sort of en energy behind it has sort of lost quite a lot now. Uh, it's now back onto CRISPR. Um, but epigenetics is the ability to turn existing genes on or off for favorable characteristics. Okay. And so, say, uh, you and me are both born with, with a certain amount of genes, and some of these genes are turned on, and some of them are turned off. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of a binary process. And through um, certain environmental factors, such as uh, ultraviolet rays, or uh, being exposed to uh, smoking or carcinogens, um, these are understood to turn to, to change the expression of certain genes on or off. And so apparently we're all born with cancer genes. Okay. But the cancer genes are hopefully turned off. And so they've okay. understood that through smoking or, you know, these, these different triggers, it can turn on the expression of these genes. Oh. And so in 2014, there was a lot of energy and research around uh, developing epigenetic technology to be an alternative to chemotherapy and cancer treatment and to send bespoke proteins to the cancer genes to reverse their expression. Flip them off. Exactly. Interesting. And so uh, that, that was the original point that I started to get excited about what would happen if with such a tangible commodity, you know, if, if, the, if we could create an alternative to, to chemotherapy and cancer treatment, what would be the difference between, you know, L'Oreal, Procter & Gamble getting hold of this technology and putting it into a shampoo to change the color or the waviness of your hair or you know your sexuality or your IQ you know yeah yeah and so on of course at the moment uh, and I still believe that epigenetic technology it's um it, it's incredibly dangerous I, I don't think there's been any scenarios of it actually working uh, because it, it affects all the other genes yeah in in its area and causes more damage than good yeah so it's uh -huh. kind of like chemotherapy in that regard as I understand <clears throat> um, it sort of attacks the bad thing but you're also attacks all the, all the, all the attacks <coughs> everything else around it as well. Yeah. yeah, but it's a really interesting concept, particularly in considering that you know with w with such a technology for life extension that there is huge amounts of global funding available to sort of evolve this, mm. and we are very much at a at a point in sort of if we zoom out in humanity in kind of uh, this this idea of what do we actually want to spend our energy on? What do we want to design? What do we want for the future of humanity and for the future of technology? Or even what do we want for the future of our evolution? Well, do we want to, you know, if we get to a point where you could put socks that make your feet stronger and, you know, <laughs> more coordination of football or something, you know, would we, is that something that we as society will want to enable? I feel like Adidas is probably doing this. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, Olympics, Stan McCartney and Adidas made um, a swimming costume um, with, with a certain textile that made that was very buoyant, it was sort of extra buoyant, and so the, the athletes wouldn't have to spend as much energy sort of keeping themselves up, they could spend more energy going forwards. Yes. And so it was very beneficial to swimmers. Yes. And the Olympic body ruled that this textile was actually, it, yes. was, it, was, it was not possible, it was illegal, it was kind of pushing against the the, the merit of the human body. You're right, you know, so we are trying to design products that do give us this incredible edge. Um, and I think in athletics or, you know, in sportswear, this is where these things have the most um, applic application. Well, right see, now. this is interesting because even we're talking about that in terms of very tangible function, like getting from A to B in the quickest amount of time. Mm. But we can also talk about the function around beauty, the function around you know certain uh, poise and posture, or the function around IQ, or the function around happiness or mental health, and mm -hmm. and all of this is possible to design. It's, it's also interesting to think that we are not an evolved human; we're just in the middle of a of a very long evolution process. Mm. In the same way that with science and technology, there is so much more to find out that just hasn't been ex un uncovered yet about how the world works. And so it's really interesting having these conversations at such a critical moment in, in sort of technology evolution, human evolution, about actually where we want this to go and 
what we hope for in terms of what, what is going to be beneficial to, to human life and humankind. Mm. And will it make us happier? Will it make us uh, more discontent or need more and want more? And that pulls us into a really interesting conversation about kind of a, sort of a, f a philosophical, philanthropic perspective on, on, on technology and evolution and how brands and marketing and products sort of play a role within that. Because you could argue that uh, a lot of technology is being harnessed by big companies to make us want more and need more, but isn't necessarily bringing us to a happier place. And so I think it's a really interesting moment for these companies to really sort of take a step back and think about their ideologies in terms of actually what they hope for, what types of lives do they want uh, consumers to be able to obtain through the development of, of you know, through utilising, buying um, and sort of entering into their world through their products. Uh, because I think that all objects are interacting with technology in some way. You know, if not now, they will be soon. Mm. Or they, they sort of have, even if they're analog, they have some sort of relationship within a wider technological sphere. Um, and I think that designers and companies not only need to think about the sort of manufacture of these objects, but think around the cultures surrounding them, but particularly in terms of the philosophy and the ideology that underpins everything about that object. Mm. And so it's, it's all derived from kind of all of this research the whole way back into genetics mm -hmm. and the way that humans sort of perceive um, positive and negative. Yeah, genetic strength. Genetic strength. But we still have the same understanding and appreciation of genetic strength as we did, you know, when... I don't know how long we've been around for, you know. So supposedly, Some people say supposedly, two, <laughs> supposedly we've, years. Been, we've been evolving... Uh, for 44,000 years. 44. 44,000 years. So... It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully we've got another 44 ahead of us. I hope so. Not us. I couldn't, couldn't stand it. I, I couldn't stand it either. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see when we get to the first 1,000 and then... <laughs> yeah. Um, um, no, but it, it's interesting because we, we, you know, in terms of male attractiveness, in terms of popular culture, physically, our brain, a kind of heterosexual woman or a homosexual guy, would consider a, a, an attractive man to be someone who would be able to hunt, gather, provide, protect. Yeah. And so that's kind of, um, you know, someone with well-defined arms and has got access to lean protein to build that muscle. Um, but you could argue that in a democratized society with social welfare, that sort of muscle mass is totally uh, wasteful to society because all you need to do as a man today is kind of sit at a computer desk for eight hours a day clicking and then go and pick a, a can off a supermarket shelf or like sit, click for your delivery service to bring you food. Mm. But what um, we posit is, as you know potential genetic strength and what we should consider but that doesn't affect really how our genes are made up and that's something that's been born out of 44,000 years and it's going to take longer than well, it's, 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 us having desk it's, jobs it's, for the last... It's, Hundred years. It's interesting so. because, of course, our brains have been evolving in that way for such a long time. And then in the past 200 years, with in sort of post-industrial society, particularly the past uh, 30, 40, with, with you know, the internet and, and kind of mechanized processes in the mm. way that we see them now, our brain hasn't had time to actually update or evolve to the way that we now live. And so the way that we compute genetic strength is still derived of our cavemen ancestors um, as opposed to actually the, the reality of the way we live now. So it's interesting when we consider what, what would be our perception of genetic strength to actually suit the way that we're living today. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think the human brain will actually update to this because all of popular culture is based upon these kind of basic principles of, of hunting, gathering, providing, protecting in terms of masculinity mm -hmm. and maybe childbearing um, and in terms of uh, femininity, in terms of testosterone expression and estrogen expression. Yeah. Um, just have a look at Love Island if you <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If, if you want to see some, some yeah. pretty clear examples of this. Yeah, the chest <laughs> might be waxed, but yeah, it's still the, the basics are the same. <laughs> and it's, it's fascinating because, of course, now, you know, we've got 
the technology in place and the protein, the like you know protein powder and and men are going and sitting in gyms at, at mm-hmm. eleven o'clock in little space underground to sort of achieve this aesthetic yeah. that is essentially signalling information based on activities that they they never need to do. Yeah, and and actually it totally outpaced. And so yeah, it's it's a really interesting situation because it's just a clear example of the fact that human evolution and technology evolution are totally out of sync. Yeah, completely. Completely. Like people really aren't, they haven't got up to speed with how technology has affected the social, social side of the real world. So people feel that, you know, social media and all of these things are in their own little closets, but, but they're not. You know, if you put something on social media, I say that it's like getting on a podium with all the cameras of the world and all the microphones and any post you put on social media is you, you know, veering this to the world, you know, at that, at that time and um, people haven't really caught up with it and so if you relate that back to how we have evolved genetically mm. over 44,000 years and as you say, the last 30 years where we're now at a point where we're kind of getting saturated with technology. You know, there are, things, there are, there are products and services out there now that are trying to move you away, that are giving mm. you chances to, you know, places where there's no Wi-Fi, things like this. You know, and these are now products and services. And so when we talk about designing ideologies for companies, it is now getting to a point where companies are realizing that if they want to buck the trend, they can be seen as a leader by taking people away from technology. It's about, I would say it's very much about having a, a clearly defined stance um, that you can, that, that your consumer can either, uh, you know, associate with or not associate with. And that's very much up to you in terms of what that means. Mm. Um, I think a lot of companies would be uh, very tempted to sort of homogenize into whatever popular culture says you should be doing at any particular moment in time. But if companies really want to be leading, it's about taking a very definitive stance. Mm. And I was going to discuss this a little bit about obesity and refined sugar. Okay. And the idea that refined sugar, um, again, a technological innovation, essentially, um, when it first arrived, I'm sure it was kind of like, uh, you know, cocaine, everyone wanted as much of it as you could get but Mm. then pretty quickly you understood that it had a sort of a a consequence that might be considered to be negative Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's exactly the same in terms of the way that we're exposing our brains to refined imagery to pornography to you know our our brains were designed to see a cave woman across the savannah and think Mm -hmm. she uh, thinks she's not half bad you know (laughs) and now we're being exposed to edited manipulated imagery at such a large extent and watching these kind of three minute videos on repeat Mm -hmm. that we're training our brains in certain ways that could be considered sort of the same as refined sugar and obesity. But of course there are all of these cultures that exist around obesity and around training your body and around how you should be feeding your body with certain foods. It's exactly the same I think with this type of technology. It's not to say that this technology image-based communication is going to end. It's just to say that there will be We're still very much in the honeymoon, in the beginning period of this, but there will be new subcultures and etiquettes such as kind of snobberies and and, and perceived perceptions of of what's appropriate and not appropriate in terms of using this technology. Government regulation helped stunt the um, refined sugar and this kind of thing. And so do you think that's then required with... Um, image-based communications and do you think that we need to be regulated? I really believe that we need to have more space and time for research and development of technology. It's a fine line between developing technology and putting it out into society because you want to be the first one and technology is always evolving very quickly and also understanding the consequences of applied technology and of course we talk about Facebook being a sort of prime example of this for sort of not really fully understanding the negative effects of its infrastructure, just putting it out and seeing what happens. Um, And of course, that has 
uh, sort of um, potentially swayed and, and manipulated political trends and you know it's, it's not just a lovely way of communicating with your family and friends mm. it's affecting uh, larger society on, on, a, on an incredible scale yeah and now we're having conversations about whether Facebook should be privatized or whether it should be uh, sort of run by the government we were talking about f um, social media here yeah you know Facebook um, does that then extend into into brands marketing their products. Absolutely, absolutely. Br brands and marketing are essentially reflections of, of people. Mm. You know, they're, they're creating uh, infrastructure through objects and through a socially understood iconography and language for people to express their identities with. You know, you're a designer. Mm. Uh, you're very core. Cool. You know, that's, that's the world that you've come from. And as a designer, do you feel government regulation would hinder you in that regard? It's interesting because I'm, I'm just thinking a lot about China <laughs> and government <laughs> regulation in China. Yeah. Uh, because I, I teach and I have Chinese students and I'm always pushing them to do political projects and there's always this tension and, and they're f fearful of, of <laughs> doing anything that's slightly out of line or not what they're meant to be doing. Interesting. Uh, and I had this one Chinese student who came up with this fantastic project about in China they know they're not free but it's nice to know where they're at in the UK we think we're free but we're not and that was a really interesting perspective on this topic you know do we do we want to be in a position where that the government is is saying what we should and shouldn't do and what the, what the paradigms are around this or do we want to be in a situation where we do just, you know, freely put out services? No one has to use Facebook if they don't want to use it. No one has to buy an iPhone if they don't want to buy it, you know? So we're conscientiously choosing to opt in. Mm. The government isn't telling us what we should and shouldn't be using. Mm. Um, and so there's definitely perspectives around this, you know, but I think we're just very much at the beginning of this, uh, this uh, such a, uh, huge uh, kind of paradigm shift happening in the way that we communicate and illustrate ourselves through objects, products, images, genes. Um, and I think there needs to be a vast amount of research into this so that we can be far more in control of it because at the moment it's kind of like, um, it's chaotic. Mm. Okay, I will say this. So I'm, I'm intrinsically a designer, hmm. but I understand that design today is not just about creating objects. It's also understanding the way that that object is communicated. It exists within a larger cultural sphere, but also how technology uh, affects that, that object. And so being a designer today, I think you not only need to be kind of a craftsman and understand the processes behind designing it, but you also need to understand marketing, mm -hmm. uh, consumer psychology, uh, and sort of have a, a sort of an overview of different technologies and how they might affect your design. This is great news for designers, fashion designers, you know, whether you're making shoes, clothes, whatever. This is really good news because actually it really broadens the horizons of being a designer. Yeah. Whereas, you know, 50 years ago, you know, really you were, you were an artist, you were drawing things on paper and someone else would take that, I guess, and go and make it. Mm. Whereas now you have to understand maybe a lot more than you used to. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, it's a, it's a continually learning process. Um, and a little like, so my background is architecture. Yeah. Um, and architects are, are very much sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. You know, you work with lots of different specialists who all understand sort of how the building actually stands up and how the cladding actually works and, you know, mm -hmm. how the electrics actually plug in. But you, uh, sort of drive this large uh, ship essentially and you understand all the different ingredients and put them together to create one elegant solution mm. um, and I think that's very much the same with with design today except all the all the components are a multitude of many different facets yeah yeah and you have to embody that ideology that we were talking about earlier on you know companies need to lead the way in what is our stance and so to be a designer within that company, you really you need, to, you need to get that brief and you need to understand it wholeheartedly. Mm. Otherwise, you're really not creating products that that company is trying to, to, push, to push out. Exactly. 
I think it's interesting to also talk about sustainability on this because I think at the moment sustainability is understood within a commercial paradigm as a, as a, a format of, of ideology that is understood and that uh, consumers want. It, it sort of has a, a market value attached to that term. Mm. But I would argue that the word sustainable and sustainability is a kind of off-the-peg ideology uh, that is sort of pre-designed um, and that actually there are um, many different variations under the branch of sustainability, but I think it's more and more important for brands and companies not to be homogenized in terms of their outlook and their perspective, but actually really stand for something. I think consumers are becoming more and more informed every day. Yeah. And uh, particularly as we see this, this sort of shift in uh, economy, perhaps uh, sort of d downturn of capitalism, mm -hmm. Um, it's giving rise to far more ideologically based uh, design yeah. and communication. It's, 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 it's becoming of paramount importance. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the more people talk about it, well, hopefully the more clear one's mind becomes on these matters. Um, although like a lot of knowledge, the more you know, the more you realise you don't know. And so the more, certainly today, the more we've talked about genetics and, mm. and design, you realise there are so many elements of discussion that really the human brain, unless we genetically mutate it, is incapable of truly understanding. I think this is also the beauty. As, as you said, designers used to be maybe someone sat sitting down with a pen and a pencil and drawing something. And now a designer today, and arguably the best designer today, is the design that allows conversations with multitude of different perspectives and minds on a large complex topic. Um, and, and for me, that is, that is really the, one of the most valuable roles of a designer today. It's almost as a communicator. Mm. Um, and in terms of having conversations about actually how we want to be developing and moving forwards through objects and products. Amazing. Yeah. Design is the new communication. Yeah. Awesome. Adam, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> nice one.